Hello, good afternoon, everyone. It's a, it's a pleasure to be here. Thank you so much, Vidak, for the invitation. It's an honor to be moderating this panel among such great professionals. And it's such a challenging time. So, well, uh, my name is Nicole Discant, and I'm head of legal and compliance at Hashdex. We are an investment advisor, a crypto-based investment advisor in Latin America and becoming pretty global right now. And before, um, I myself come from the traditional uh, market and financial market. I've uh, been practicing law for over 20 years and compliance uh, in different roles and positions. And I also co-founded a hack tech, a compliance management system. Please, Jasmine. Hi, Jasmine Burgess. Um, I am COO and CRO at uh, One River Digital. We're a digitally focused asset management firm, but we do more than asset management. We straddle infrastructure building. Um, I've been in the risk space for 25 years, the first half in banking, straddled over after the uh, innate um, prescriptive risk that Basel put on everyone after GFC and went back to where we could really think about risk and put risk in properly. Uh, so that's me. Yeah, hi, my name is Martin Leinweber. I'm a digital asset product strategist at Market Director Indexes. We are providing index solutions for equities, bonds, and uh, digital asset indexes since 2017. And uh, we offer those products mainly to other asset managers who issue exchange data products, but we also cooperate with crypto exchanges and, and hedge funds. So everybody who is interested in benchmarking. Thank you, Martin. If you can speak a little bit louder, because it's a, a bit tricky to hear you guys. Sure. My name is Mark Leeds. I'm a tax partner with Mayor Brown here in New York. Um, I specialize in financial products and financial strategies, uh, including helping people make lemonade from lemons, which uh, figuring out how to make use out of losses from uh, what's going on currently in the crypto market, helping with disclosure, um, and other types of issues that are posed by investing in crypto. Hi, my name is Neil Schwamm. I'm a head of operational risk at L1 Digital. We're a Zurich-based asset advisor, uh, Web3 and crypto native. Uh, we run a um, multi-manager fund of funds and two VC funds. Uh, we invest in tokens, directs, equities. My own background is from traditional fund of funds and asset management on the risk side in uh, global macro, real estate, and interest rates. Thank you, Neil. Uh, just before we get started, if you guys in the audience could just speak a little, uh, it's a little bit tricky for us here. Um, and you guys, please send us questions, raise your hands. We would love this to be more interactive and we would, you know, love to hear from you if you have questions to our lovely panelists today. Um, so I normally like to think before I start a panel like this, I normally like to think about a positive agenda, a positive way to see the topic. And I must confess that today was a little hard for me. Um, but I ended up finding one positive angle, I will tell you later. Um, but, but of course, we are, the reason is obvious. We are seeing a, a melting down of our digital assets. It's a complete de detachment of the, between price and actual real value. So, um, and what does it mean? What can we do uh, as an industry to, you know, uh, act on that crisis and maybe take good opportunities out of it. Um, I think we can all agree here that that's, that's a bad act. We are seeing this because of bad actors, uh, mainly. I wouldn't say completely, but mainly. And that's a lack of trust. And we, as an industry, I believe we can, we have the power and the duty to act on that and, you know, find ways to purge bad actors. Um, since we don't have a regulation in place, we have to act as an industry and think together. So I think more than ever, these heads in this room and here are needed to think, you know, good ways, good, good outcomes. Uh, what can we do? So I think I will start with a question, and I apologize, that, was, that wasn't in our prep call, but since the market changed drastically, within these two weeks, uh, I would start ask, um, ask, asking you guys, what's your take on this crisis and how we as an industry could propose solutions to, to you know, make 
purge bad actors and, and secure this technology, not only the value of our assets and our clients' values, but most importantly, the, the, the underneath technology for the next generations. Jasmine, do you want to start? That's a huge question. Um, so I'm less negative than I think you are in, in many ways. Uh, we've seen a demise in uh, a lot of hiring being rescinded and people la being laid off. I see that as a risk management practice. Um, there's a lot of hiring that has gone on to the point of exhaustion where uh, talent is just impossible to find. So we're getting people coming out of colleges that aren't trained that um, at valuations, you know, at the hundreds uh, of price per earnings, made a lot of sense. But now we're seeing valuations coming right down. So keep the cash and have a look to see, rather than building everything yourself, what you can now buy and what is a better price. So pure corporate risk management 101, and I think it's very sensible. Um, I think in terms of lunar and these types of algorithms uh, for the stable coin, I think, it, again, it's going to show which ones work and the mechanisms are working very well for all of the other stable coins. Now, there are still proponents there that I'm nervous about with stable coins. Um, and being a risk person, I think I maybe obsess a little bit too much about risk, um, but that's my job. Um, so the algorithms uh, for Luna always had flaws. We didn't include it in our index. There's a lot of reasons we don't include a lot of protocols in our index that other people do include in their index. Um, we do a lot of an analysis on you know, treasury, the holdings that, they're, that are there, how much a dispersion of holdings there is in each of the protocols. Um, the full gambit of risk needs to be done before getting comfortable with what's there. Celsius, again, total liquidity mismanagement, right? So you're locking stuff up, but you're offering one day liquidity. No one even in the hedge fund world would do that. So um, it's just a lesson on um, marketing versus the pragmatic um, you know, duty that you have to your investors that you can deliver what you're saying you're delivering. And so it's transparency and a risk acumen that we just need to make sure your own investors, as in, you yourself as an investor, think through before going there. Fantastic, thank you. Do you want to go? Well, I think I mentioned in our prep call that everybody has his own wallet of shame at the moment. So a lot of it is at 90% plus down, even the blue chips are 70% uh, down. And I think we need this crypto winter as a cleansing process. And um, as Warren Buffett said, when the tide is out, you see who's swimming naked. So arguably the, the crypto market reminds me of nudist camp at the moment, but um, this doesn't mean that it has to go to zero because think of it, everything will be tokenized. Everything, equities, bonds, commodities, real estate, your identity, all arts, collectibles, etc., And uh, they will be on an open, permissionless, censorship resistant blockchain because I hear a lot, oh, we need the enterprise blockchains again. No, we don't because those are closed Excel sheets. Yeah, you don't need a blockchain for that. And as a blockchain needs a token for its security, I'm, I'm, uh, I'm pretty optimistic that uh, the next bull market will come. We at Market Vector, we just developed new products. We are thinking of yield products, for, for example, at the moment. And it's a normal process we went through in 2018-19 again. My focus is definitely different than the focus I'm hearing, because I come at it from purely a legal perspective. And it's even more specific than that. It's tax legal. And in terms of investment into the space, what we have seen consistently over time is a, a, certainly a lack of transparency and a lack of disclosure. And there are the Internal Revenue Service and Treasury and uh, the federal government in general has uh, created an opportunity 
to come forward and uh, report. So there is a, now a, on, uh, you can actually come forward if you've been engaging in crypto transactions and haven't previously reported. You can do so in a two-step process that will enable you to substantially reduce the amount of penalties that will be assessed. What's also happening, which is really, really important, is beginning next year, which is really close, the crypto exchanges now are going to be required to report extensive information on crypto trading uh, to the U.S. government and send out reports to investors that mimic the same type of reports that you normally would expect from commodity or security investing. So when you couple the opportunity to come forward that the Internal Revenue Service has offered uh, and with voluntary disclosure that you can do on a, it's a Form 8938 that you can file with your tax return, um, this is a really the meltdown creates a great opportunity to come forward because the value of the holdings right now um, has decreased so much. What the opportunity to come forward also does is it creates opportunities for recognizing the losses, which you couldn't do if the assets weren't disclosed. And because the tax law hasn't caught up to crypto yet, strategies that wouldn't necessarily work with other commodities or with securities are, are uh, certainly available with respect to uh, creating opportunities to recognize losses with respect to crypto holdings. Interesting, yeah. Always thinking about the good, the good sides, right? Good, po the positive agenda. Neil, what's your take on that? Uh, yeah, broadly, I think transparency is an in, in, important point. Um, at this moment, we see things adjusting, certain things failing, um, but things are succeeding as well. Mm -hmm. But I think the point is that it's important to be reflective on the mistakes that you might have made as a firm, others may have made, um, be humble about actually if your process has worked. Um, but as investors, many questions end up not getting asked or not fully kind of buttoned up when things are really going kind of flying. Um, it happens in every market for the history of the world. Um, so at the moment, as investors, you know, we don't like to say, yeah, we have all the leverage now, you know, valuations are coming down. I mean, maybe it's partially true, um, but we get to ask questions now and they get maybe a little more attention. It's specifically in my area on the risk side. Questions that are maybe the least sexy, um, but the ones that end up being pretty important. Um, and when these things happen, I mean, these are market failures, but these ultimately are also operational failures. And if you look back to how certain market failures happen. They happen from a risk management perspective. Uh, they happen for sometimes fairly mo mundane and prosaic reasons. Um, and again, what we're doing as a firm, number one, we're looking at, again, mistakes we may have made, things we might have missed, trying to be humble about where our processes worked, but still looking at them now because things haven't necessarily cooled down, but it's a reflective moment. And you've got to take the time and be productive the same way you would in your life. Um, so we look at our own processes, we look at every investment even more closely, have to kind of maybe, depending on the nature of the investment, rebuild our thesis, um, look for areas of potential failure, um, and look at our investments. On the VC side, looking at every single team and asking themselves effectively what we're talking about right here, which is, okay, what's, the world has changed. Yeah, you have your runway, you know your business, but what do you think you missed? Yeah, agreed. Um, just before we move uh, to another topic, I was curious in your speech, uh, Martin, about uh, some few years from now, we all will be tokenized, and uh, I just said th something very close to that, uh, that was like, we are currently living a sandbox, so everything is like we are in a very... So how far you you think we are from this tokenized world? Well, technically, we can do it today. Uh, the problem is uh, the regulators all around the world um, slowing this process for, I think, also good reasons. Yeah? So uh, we have to need more regulation and regulatory clarity. Uh, but I think technically, um, it's, it's doable um, today. And we're already seeing that. And those tokenized instruments are getting mostly used in, in, uh, for qualified investors. Um, but that's not in the ethos of uh, crypto, yeah? So um, that said, I think um, 
um, I'm pretty I'm pretty positive at least what I see uh, in Europe, especially in Germany, in terms of tokenization. So we tokenize the first bond transactions. We are in a good way to tokenize equities. Um, so these are tokenized securities. Yeah, we also have tokenized real estate in Europe. Uh, I don't know. I, I'm, I'm not so familiar with the U.S. regulation, how far it is there. Um, but um, it's it's hard to say if it's one year, two years, three years away from a regulatory perspective. Maybe I hand, the, yeah. hand over to Mark. I would I say know. the regulator is, is one of the angles. I think there are a lot of people making a lot of money from T plus one and T plus two settlements. So there's going to be quite a bit of a lobbying action um, against tokenization. But um, I was at Brevin for four years and spun out all their infrastructure and ran basically back office, middle office. And I just thought that stuff happened. You know, I thought that was just easy. It was on another floor and you, you did a trade and the traders just, and oh my God, it is a process. There's breaks, there's reconciliations that don't work. It's days of people and it's so inefficient. So with crypto, it's definitely, um, not crypto, but more tokenization and blockchain mechanisms. The efficiencies are so ripe. But the thing about stablecoin, um, and we, we come to this, right? So. A huge proponent of the way the market works is short-term money market, and cash typically isn't run in bonds for most hedge funds. It's a ETF version of short-term bonds, and that's a T plus one, T plus two settlement. The reason it's T plus two and the stock market couldn't get closer to T plus one from T plus two is because bonds take a day to repo. So you really have to squeeze that entire mechanism to very short term face. So we're working with a lot of the regulators on how we can get tokenized money market instruments in. That will be the first step to then squeeze the whole timeline in. Yeah. In Brazil, we just had like four uh, companies coming out of the sand regulatory sandbox. So we did, I think last week or two weeks ago, the first tokenized security actually trading in an in a OTC market. So it's, it was pretty uh, nice to see inside. Uh, I did some, some private work for them before and how it was uh, organized and it's going to be much more efficient, definitely. Uh, so talking about this E2s of crypto versus ETFs and offering indirect exposure to uh, uh, digital assets, Jasmine, can you uh, let Tell us a little bit about your business model and what clients asking for these days. Sure. So we started in 2020. Um, access was such a difficult thing, uh, even just for Bitcoin, people wanting to get hands on, you know, just the, the token. Um, so we have Grayscale. They've, you know, done a very good job with building the trust. We've seen how that has sort of, you know, created sort of a bit of a rift in valuation without it becoming an ETF. So we need liquid product. Um, We've taken the next step, and Anil was kind of talking about this before, where if you have Bitcoin, that's great. It's just sitting there. Why should me, we, as an asset manager, get an active management fee for just having someone sit Bitcoin in a, in a vault? That, that, those fees are, you know, long gone. Um, so the directionality is really active and alpha, and a lot of people really need the, that, that active or alpha, and they need an index to be able to define what alpha is. Uh, so alpha can be alpha against your own portfolio or alpha against the industry. Um, so we're doing both. We've got the index out there. Um, and then in terms of access points, Anil was saying, you know, having actively managed strategies tokenized so you can trade them instantly. So we've gone, okay, but then if you sell one token and its proponents are Bitcoin, Ethereum and some short something else, and then you go into another strategy, which is Bitcoin, Ethereum and short other stuff, then you're now doing a tax realization event of moving from one to another. Why don't we just do this? We'll set you up an account, a separately managed account in your name or your fund's name or in your family trust's name, and we actively manage it. You choose this strategy, you want to move to that strategy, We'll just trade exactly what you need to switch it over. And we can do it at scale with the cloud, combined with Bitcoin, um, directly in a custodian wallet. We don't even have to move it, which is the biggest risk that you have in this industry, directly in the wallet. We'll trade it right there in, a, in Coinbase. Um, and so that's what we're really working on right now. So SMAs, most 
popular. Nice. Um, and Neil, in terms of the investment, setting up an investment vehicle and getting started, uh, finding the right service providers, custodians, exchanges, index providers, everything, uh, can you tell us, you know, um, what what's the most important thing in the risk perspective? Um, I can talk about it from two perspectives: doing due diligence on funds that are kind of in their startup phase, um, and our own funds, which are also in their startup phase. So they kind of mirror each other, um, kind of by design, but also kind of, yeah, just timing-wise. Um, the typical questions you'd ask yourself when you're setting up, um, there is setting up banking relationships, compliance relationships, your counterparties on the trading side, custody. I mean, all the pieces that we fit that fit together in the traditional world. Um, one thing that's, I think the timing of it is one thing that is kind of underestimated in terms of how long it takes to onboard with a bank. If you plan to launch your fund in a month and you don't have the final draft of your docs in order or something like that, you may not launch for four or five months. Um, that's in kind of the worst case. Now, that's important. Why? Because if you're planning to enter the market, depending on your strategy, at a you know, more or less specific time, if you're going to launch the fund, you're going to launch the fund. But at the same time, if you're paying attention to these things, you may want to get in. We launched in November of 2018. Um, actually, by design, it was, it was a bear market, and that's and we had diligence to space, and we knew what we wanted to do. Um, but if you're launching a fund now, uh, number one, there's a lot of backlog on the service provider side, huge amount of backlog. Number two, the compliance requirements for crypto firms, they may not be any heavier than they are, but the scrutiny, I can tell you, is intense, um, and it can be a full-time job, sometimes my full-time job, um, when you don't expect it. And, and it's, it's considerable. The, the positive aspect of it is that people tend to think, in the outside world, it depends that this is some wild west where anybody can open an account with Coinbase and anybody can do whatever they want. And I will say it's quite the opposite. When you're getting to the point of looking at counterparties, depending on your strategy and custodians as well, you'll find yourself somewhat restricted um, based on what you plan to do. Um, if you want to do a very liquid strategy and Bitcoin and Ethereum and those type of things, yeah, you'll find Coinbase, Gemini, I mean, you're going to have, you know, a fairly established set of service providers that are going to give you more or less commodity-like services for the most part. OTC desks as well. Once you get a little more off the run, um, particularly like on the token side and on the custody side, then you're really restricted to who supports what. Um, so normally you'd want to put a process in place where you do your kind of, you know, legitimate counterparty due diligence, looking at their balance sheet, that type of thing, seeing who funds them, how they manage their own treasury. And to be honest with you, we're asking these questions like today, um, all day, every day. And I was talking about earlier in terms of transparency. These are the type of questions that six months ago people were like, hey, you want to have the, co the coin with us? Just take the account. Um, now it's a little different. Um, so you then end up getting kind of restricted to the custodians that are available to you depending on what you're going to trade. Um, if you're going to stake, there are timing components to it as well. Things don't move T plus one or T plus two would actually be fantastic um, if you want to move certain, certain coins around. Um, so I guess what I'm getting at is the timing of things um, is something to consider because things do do take a long time and the choices are out there and there are more choices than there were when we launched in November 2018. Um, but the world is bigger. Um, so there's there's more bottlenecks as well. Right. Yeah, uh, perfect. And since you mentioned staking, that's a, an interesting topic for us in ETFs. We are studying a lot how to do so with, you know, uh, within the ETF. So I would like to hear from you your takes, pros and cons on staking from your perspective? Staking is, if you're not staking, you're basically eroding your own value. It's like having a dividend check and ripping it up and not cashing it. So it's it's an ownership that you're not uh, you know, being able to partake in. So it absolutely should be something you do. Staking though is an active strategy. So you can't do it by a trust. So a lot of people have like yourselves at Hashtags set up companies over in Cayman and then build an ETF on top of that. 
there are pros and cons to it, and it's you know it's an incredible workaround. Um, some of the problems are that you can't bring losses from offshore back onto onshore with tax uh, harvesting, um, and you know the like. But yeah, staking is incredible. Some of the things though that are um, unaccessible to retail is staking, and I would think that if you're an institutional level or you're looking at getting into a private fund, there are a lot of questions to ask on, are you staking out of cold storage? How secure is it? Are you double baking? So how much can you follow the consensus mechanisms of that protocol? Are you really um, you know, skilled in that specific protocols staking? And that is a very big skill. Not like There are a lot of vendors out there that offer all the the protocols, and then we'll see one of the protocols, i.e. Solana or Tezos, do an upgrade on their tech. I mean, these are just sexy databases. We talk a lot about sexy databases. So um, they do an upgrade on their technology, and then people are like, oh, we can't stake anymore because something's tw twitched. And then you'll see who out of the C5 vendors manages that change quickly, and we, we see that with a lot of the top three. Uh, and then the others really struggle. So I wouldn't try and do this myself. Uh, we, we don't self-custody, we don't self-stake, we don't trust ourselves with any of that. Um, you can lose all your assets pretty quickly if you get it wrong. Yeah, 100% agreed. Do you have a view on that? Yeah, I think you, you should definitely uh, stake. Why? Because these uh, protocols are inflationary. Yeah? So they are constantly issuing new tokens. Yeah? That's their security budget. Uh, blockchains with a high throughput uh, issue more. Uh, Ethereum issues less than we... I don't talk about Ethereum much. It, it goes too far. But um, you have to look at the real yields. Yeah? Um, they are quite attractive. Yeah? It depends on uh, the protocol you're looking at. So that's the reason why we think uh, we have to, to create a proof-of-stake index as well, including the staking yield. It's not that easy. Yeah? It's the old garbage in, garbage out problem. So you really have to have reliable data. Those um, staking protocols have different bonding periods, etc. So uh, it's not easy, but also not impossible. And uh, I really can only encourage people to, to have a closer look at it because it definitely makes sense. And I, I'd like to compare that with a kind of a definite yield, although it's not the 100% correct terminology. Mark, do you have a view on tax perspective? Tax perspective, I do, not much else, but from a tax perspective, two really significant issues are raised by staking. First, currently, the IRS has taken the position that staking is taxable. Yeah, which I'm, is I've, a... Which I've is, heard from my lawyer, and it's like... Right. But, oh, that's not, you know, that, that's... income. And yeah, that it results in current income. That can be a mixed blessing. And because in one sense, when you stake, the value of the, of the new token may be so low as to uh, be an income recognition event, but one with not a lot of consequence. On the other hand, nobody likes recognizing income uh, before they're actually been able to reduce it to cash. But it's not necessarily terrible because the value of uh, what you receive at the time that you receive it um, is really low. The IRS takes the position that staking isn't taxable until you can dispose of the new coin. So if it can't be removed from your wallet, that's not yet a taxable event. And then of much more concern is uh, currently the way that the uh, information reporting rules for next year are currently written. And that is that someone who stakes could be treated as a dealer um, who's subject to providing information returns. Uh, there's been a colloquy back and forth between Congress and the IRS IRS, and uh, the IRS has uh, since, I'm not going to say fully relented, but has issued some guidance which uh, suggests that they're going to take a narrower definition of who's a dealer and required to report, and that people who stake are not going to be treated as dealers. There's a bill that was proposed by Kristen Gillibrand, a, a New York senator, which would codify that result, but that looks like that bill is going nowhere, but I think it embodies a sense of Congress on the issue. Got it. Thank you. I have, I have a question on that, actually. So would a staking infrastructure provider, there's two, three large ones in the space, would they be considered dealers under that? Under, under the current that? definition, it's highly likely that the answer to that question is yes. Okay. Um, so that would mean an infrastructure provider, which is effectively in some ways like an ISP because they're basically running nodes for something. Um, so what validators do, they're running nodes on behalf of their clients. 
So they would be potentially subject to some sort of regulation where they would be considered dealers because they're basically harvesting the yield for you? Uh, regulation, that's an interesting way of putting it because that's not what I'm talking about. Okay. What I'm, what I'm talking about is being subject to information reporting requirements. Okay. In other words, when you, uh, a staking operation like that, uh, under the current definition, yes, would be required to send out forms 1099 or 1042S's to non-U.S. persons uh, with respect to uh, coins that were uh, received in a staking or mining operation. Okay. Okay. Uh, there's been some, the, the pushback from the staking companies has been, we don't have the information that a broker has. That we only, you know, that we don't have information on who we're staking for. That we can't, we can't see past the blockchain. That's right. They have the wallet addresses, but they do also have the corporate entities that own the, that onboard with them that have the wallet addresses. We can take this offline. Yeah, yeah. It's, it's an interesting point. Um, in terms of whether you should or should not stake, this is not investment advice, by the by the way. Um, but the thesis of investing in these tokens is. Uh, number one, to support the networks, because that's effectively what staking is doing. You're providing to the security of the networks, which is basically what underlies this en entire approach to investing. Um, but there's different types of stakings. Um, if you're staking to a DeFi pool, for example, I mean, th the point is it's not all created equal. So when you hear the term, uh, the risk with one type of staking may not be the same with the other type of staking. Um, if we look at Terra Luna, there was assets that were staked, but then you have to look at, well, what is the yield coming from? Why are you getting that? Um, versus, and this is really blockchain dependent, um, and then goes to the integrity of the blockchain. Mm -hmm. um, so And we, then liquid ETH is and, in a similar category to that. E so how exactly can you have liquid right. ETH when ETH is locked up? Uh, so why? Because they're That's borrowing, right. and leverage plus crypto probably doesn't need to mix. But uh, and not only yeah. that, it's not, you know, if it it's kind of one-way liquidity. I mean, it goes, it, it's, it's supposed to be pegged, but if you can't withdraw it at the peg at the time you want to do it, then it's really not really pegged. Um, it's a nice so, data point for valuation. That's right. Yeah. That's, that, that, that's right. I mean, the same way you would look at a, like a grayscale trust, for example, like how do you, I mean, the, the valuation is not so straightforward depending on the timing of it. Um, but there's something also that may not be so obvious if you're investing in funds that stake, there's an administrative component to managing the staking when you're coming towards year end. Um, if you're investing in DeFi, the assets that are staked to certain pools, uh, if they're non-custodial, so an auditor will not verify those assets so normally the process is the assets need to be redeemed from the staking pool before year end into a custodial wallet so they can at least get a clean audit. Um, it's not obvious, and if that's not done, you can run into a variety of problems with your audit. No, and that's yeah. very interesting what you're saying because we were in a SRO committee that I'm part of discussing how to address this in self-regulation and how to you know, address how the custodian will recognize an asset that it's take. So it's, it's a whole thing, but I uh, appreciate your thoughts. Um, moving on to due diligence and selecting the right tokens for the portfolio. Maybe let's start with uh, Martin. Um, so can you explain to us some of the requirements, the criteria that you guys look to the, before allowing a token to go to the index? How do you have like fundamentals, quantitatives, criteria? Yeah, so that, that really depends on the index, but um, as you can imagine, an and, and index needs a definable quantitative rules at best. So um, we start normally with the top 100 universe. Yeah? I know there are 19,000 tokens out there, but um, it's very concentrated. So the top 100 token make, in market code terms, roughly 95% plus. Yeah? So that's a good starting point. And from that, um, we apply market cap restrictions, yeah, so um, a market cap weighting. But the more tricky thing is um, to assess the liquidity. And uh, so we have different liquidity criteria, but even if you take a pretty simple one, so average daily turnover on a specific time frame, um, you have to ask which exchanges do I need for that, yeah? So you also have to be able to um, rating the exchanges as they are all 
unregulated. So yes, some act as if they are regulated, but they aren't. And so um, that's very important. Um, and uh, so uh, liquidity for us is, is pretty important because um, we want that our clients can replicate the index. Yeah, that's, that's pretty important. That said, every index, I would say, is a customization, a customization process as we don't have uh, a market standard. We don't have uh, standard closing time. Uh, we don't have standard quotation pairs. So we have no consolidated tape. We have to produce that. And uh, that's really dependent on the client. So uh, very recently, uh, we did a metaverse index. And so uh, we advised that our client uh, doesn't just look at the US dollar pair, but also at the BTC pair, stablecoin pairs. So um, every client comes with another restriction set. And so we recognize that a very important restriction set is uh, the custodian and the market maker the client has, so this, this further shrinks your, your asset universe. And so um, it's a lot of advisory, back and forth, back testing, having a call, adjusting uh, before you have an index. It's not that, I would say, easy as in the traditional world where you have all these standards um, in, in, the, in the equity or bond world. Uh, but on the other side, it makes this, this makes this thing interesting because maybe we can uh, set a standard together with our clients. And that's very difficult in a traditional world. Do you like to add something on that? Yeah, you, uh, so MVIS does our index, and you, you guys did a fabulous job. But we were the same. We thought, oh, well, let's do this. It'll take us two or three months. And uh, six months, and you feel like your nuances of the questions you're asking are just incredible. And the work you guys do with crypto compare at rating the quality of the exchanges that you're looking at pulling data from is huge. We we do a, a fundamental overlay, so we, we do a quick view on, we don't think that privacy coins are gonna be suitable for institutions in the US. So ideally we're creating an index that we um, want institutions to look to as a, you know, what's the growth of the industry rather than just using Bitcoin then we need to work out what can they even access. So removing privacy coins, removing tokens that have treasury pools that are too high. So we had a uh, file coin. Um, you know, I, I think on the border, Matic is just really holding quite a lot. Now, the problem with uh, an ownership, imagine if you were buying, you know, corporate shares or, or stocks, because we all like the analogy, and someone held 95% of it you're probably going to be a little bit more hesitant in buying those stocks than if, you know, you, the highest ownership was 5%. So we have these regulatory disclosure rules for that same reason. Um, if you have the owner issuing 5% and they take and they hold 95 in their treasury, it's not really something that we feel we want our investors to go into because there's a definite rug pull risk there. So all of that information gets uh, examined before uh, filtering into... Uh, MVIS, then do all of the calculations uh, after that. Nice. Thank you. Um, do you want to add? No. Let's say about what, what else? I mean, you, wonder, uh, we, you anticipated uh, uh, some of the tax uh, upcoming movements here, but can you, uh, do you have any perspective to share with the audience, Mark, about uh, what's, what's uh, new in this uh, tax horizon? Yeah, sure. Um, there are, really are two separate tracks that people need to think about for tax, for U.S. tax. Um, first is disclosure and reporting that's going to be required. Uh, the, re the reporting that investors are going to start receiving in 2024 in respect of 2023, I think is going to be shocking relative to the lack of reporting that's occurred so far. Uh, the rules that are on the books uh, require the crypto exchanges to provide exactly the same reports and basis calculations that uh, the securities industry took 
maybe eight to 10 years uh, to provide. And that is currently scheduled uh, to kick in next year. The, we've been waiting for guidance from the Internal Revenue Service, uh, the US Internal Revenue Service, on how to, they're going to implement that. And we haven't received any. And now it's actually, you know, we're approaching the half year mark. Um, it's quite possible that that gets pushed back a little bit. Um, on the international front, um, I think uh, most investors at this point have heard of FATCA and CRS, which are the two international coordination standards that are used for securities and commodities and for bank account holdings. That regimen is about to become active for crypto as well. So the anonymity that uh, folks have had by investing in crypto is, is about to be lost. And in, interestingly as well, the, uh, when a person transfers his crypto assets from an exchange to a private wallet, that's now going to be fully reportable beginning as of 2023 as well. And for investors subject to US tax, moving fast is maybe not the best thing to do because that means you'll never be able to onshore the assets again. Uh, that they will be permanently locked abroad. Now, maybe you want to buy a condo in Dubai, um, and so never, really, and so never being able to onshore the assets may not be the end of the world, uh, but it's certainly going to be a huge detriment for folks. The other thing which, uh, so reporting uh, both domestically and internationally is certainly on the horizon and is going to kick in big time uh, beginning next year. Also, uh, with respect to gain recognition, loss recognition, I guess um, if folks entering the market today uh, gain or, or, or in at a price below, I guess the 18,000, 19,000 that uh, Bitcoin is today, they still have unrecognized gains. Um, good and a very nice place to be if you got in that early. But for folks with um, unrecognized losses in their crypto portfolio, we've been working with a lot of people in loss harvesting. How do I uh, recognize these current losses and yet be able to maintain my exposure? And that's been a really interesting opportunity. Uh, security or lending out of crypto coins in, in the security space, lending out of securities is a non-taxable event. That wasn't always so. There is a statute on the books that makes that the case today. So lending out of crypto assets creates an opportunity for lost harvesting. So that's one way to do it. That's an interesting take. And yeah. separately managed accounts allow you to do that rather than working out with the pool where you got in. Um, it's nice that you think people have made gains. Yeah, yeah so th that, that certainly. And then um, there's, uh, with respect to other wash sale opportunities, right? If you're in one type of cryptocurrency, uh, selling that and regaining exposure uh, to another one or using an ETF, uh, the pro shares actually comes to mind as one for Bitcoin. Mark, where do you think the crypto will fall when it comes to commodity stocks and everything being a safe harbor for investment management here in the US? So all of the active management for crypto has to go offshore because uh, it's not in the safe harbor. Do you see that? Oh, 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 oh. all right. Yeah. So, so the, the question, uh, let me back up for a second. For non-US investors who trade stocks, securities, and commodities in the US, there is a statutory safe harbor that is frequently known by its code number that happens on occasion. This is called um, 864B. Um, and the A64B safe harbor allows you to trade securities and commodities. That's how a hedge fund managed out of Greenwich, Connecticut can bring in all of these non-US investors and not subject them to US tax, regardless of whether or not um, it's a pass-through in the US or whether or not it's a Cayman master that's treated as a partnership. Um, under the current, so here's what I, I think most folks are thinking about crypto. In 2014, the IRS came out with a ruling that said crypto should be treated as a commodity. So one could reasonably uh, in, infer from that that the commodities trading safe harbor does apply to crypto. So I think that most people uh, believe that crypto trading can be done from the US, that you don't necessarily have to move the trading offshore in order to protect non-US investors. Um, the, the Gillibrand bill, which I mentioned a, a few minutes ago, would, specific, would make a specific reference to that. Um, I think even in the absence of the specific reference, most people believe that the safe harbor applies today. 
that will hopefully become clear with the financial resp responsible financial innovative financial. Oh my God! Responsibility Act, the IFR, it, I R F I. It, because it's defining digital assets as a as a commodity. So right, well, which the IRS is already under existing law has done. Right. Guys, I think we are running out of time here. I would like to have uh, uh, give the audience an opportunity to have the last question. Does anyone? No. Okay. So I think I would just. D does anyone like to add anything before we finish? Thank you so much. It was very nice to be here. Thank you. Thank you.